ASMR channel where every week I whisper about a different horror movie that I love. This week is a little bit different though for several reasons. First off, I know it's still November, which means we are technically still in viewer request month where I take requests from you all about movies you want to hear me whisper about and I honor those requests. As I said last week, November is an interesting month because these videos come out on Monday, right? And there are five Mondays in November, which means there's essentially one extra day than there would be for weeks in a month, if that makes sense. So, I did have one horror-adjacent movie that I knew I wanted to talk about this month because it kind of has to do with Thanksgiving, and you're watching this on the Monday before Thanksgiving, so I really wanted to talk about that one, and no one had requested it yet, and I understand why, because it's not quite a horror movie, which I'll get to in a little bit. So, this week I'm breaking my own rules a little bit. I'm not talking about a film that you requested, but one that I thought would be appropriate for the Thanksgiving holiday, the only horror-ish horror movie that I thought would be appropriate for the Thanksgiving holiday. And then in the final week, uh, next Monday, we'll pick it back up with the viewer requests. I, I've already gotten a few, and I think I know which one I'm going to talk about, so I think that's pretty locked in, so stay tuned for that. But today, we are going to be talking about 1993's The Addams Family Values. I could be wrong. I think it's the first time on this ASMR channel that I'm talking about a sequel before I talk about the original movie. I love the original Adams Family. Um, not the 60s TV show. I mean, I like that too. I just don't know it so well. Um, but the film that came out a few years before this one, I love that one too. But if we're talking about Thanksgiving, this film, this sequel, The Adams Family Values, as a very specific tie to that holiday. And you might be thinking, well, you're cheating. It's not really a horror movie. And you're right. I wouldn't consider either of the Adams Family movies a horror. For reasons I'll elaborate on in a minute. But I, I just couldn't resist. I feel like it's one of the few films that's become a Thanksgiving staple. And it actually has to do with the holiday. I know a lot of people watch the Godfather series or the Rocky series or... Um, a lot of other different classic movie series that tend to air over Thanksgiving, over the long break. But when I think about it, there really aren't a lot of movies that take place on Thanksgiving, horror movies or otherwise, um, that get a lot of airtime. That movie Home for the Holidays with Holly Hunter comes to mind. I think there's a, at least a scene in While You Were Sleeping that takes place at Thanksgiving, but like I said, those aren't, aren't horror movies. The only pure horror movie that I could think of that has to do with Thanksgiving is Thanksgiving, which is about a mutant puppet turkey that runs around <laughs> killing people, and I don't know, it's campy, and I'm, campy is not really my style of horror, so I didn't really want to talk about that one, so instead I chose the Adams Family Values. A couple things, just a few housekeeping things before we get into this. Uh, you may notice the lights around me look a little bit different, maybe not as concentrated, maybe not as bright, and that's an, a flub on my part. Uh, my wife and I are, are getting ready to go see my parents. Don't worry, we're all being safe about it. We've gotten tested, and anyway, we don't have to get into that, but we are going to see my parents uh, for a small Thanksgiving together with them, and she uses these lights to film uh, auditions and callbacks and things like that, and she brings them with us on the road because, you know, you never know when you're going to get a call to audition for something, and all, all auditions are remote right now, so those lights are packed away 
ready to go in the car tomorrow morning, so that's why um, I'm just using the, the room light, my overhead light, and my lamp, so apologies if the aesthetic of this video is a little bit lower budget than normal. I'm still getting the hang of the exact angle I like to use and the exact lighting quality. I, I think I've settled on a sound quality for this microphone, at least for the time being. As things progress, who knows, maybe I'll get some fancier equipment, but, um, so yeah, I just wanted to point that out in case you were noticing and wondering why the lights were changing all of a sudden. Um, second order of housekeeping, I wanted to give a huge thanks to Daily Dead for featuring me in their horror highlight section. They actually featured me a couple weeks ago and I didn't know it had published, so it's been up, uh, I think since November 5th. It was my ASMR Dr. Loomis roleplay. Um, there's a little write-up on it. Nothing huge, just a nice little mention, and I really, really appreciate them for showcasing me in that way. It's the first bit of press I've got, and it always feels good to see your work showcased on websites you really enjoy, and I love Daily Dead. They're a great source for news and horror history and just opinions and everything else, so thank you, Heather Wixon and the team over there for um, giving my little smart channel a bump. Thank you for that. All right. I think that's all of the business to get out of the way. Let's talk about the Adams family values, uh, which I would call a dark comedy. If anything, it, the, the reason the movie feels horror adjacent to me is because the whole thing about the Adams family is that they're a spooky ooky family, right? They're not necessarily full-on monsters. I would say Lurch, their butler, is the closest thing to being supernatural. Um, he looks like Frankenstein's monster. You have Thing, which is a disembodied hand. I guess that's full-on supernatural. Uncle Fester has a little bit of a, an Igor vibe about him, but none of them are necessarily into terrorizing the people around them for no good reason. It's more that they just enjoy odd, dark, macabre, sometimes violent things. But the whole joke with the Adams family is that they still have a great love for each other, right? They're based on these New Yorker cartoons that came out in the 30s and then eventually spawned a live-action television show, then an animated television show, and then this live-action movie from the 90s, then the sequel to that, and now there's a CGI animated uh, Adam's Family movie. There's a very successful musical, so it's become kind of this empire, but throughout, I would say the characterizations are a little bit different depending on the format, but the consistent concept about the Adam's Family from the very beginning was, let's take these almost horror archetypes, but put them in a normal upper-class American family and almost make them more affectionate and loving than most American families may seem to be on the surface. So you're getting the humor comes from this really nice juxtaposition that, yeah, they have this weird pet octopus and a pet lion and the brother and sister are always coming up with ways to creatively hurt each other. But at the same time, there's a true bond there, there's true affection there, there's true love there amongst this family. So it's it's almost seeing a very normie version of figures of people that we would otherwise consider horrific. And like I said, that's consistent across the board, no matter what the medium is for the Adams family. Even that weird video game from the 90s, Fester's Quest, which is about the people in the Adams Family Town getting abducted by aliens, and Uncle Fester has to save the day with his ray gun. Even that has some themes of family bonding in it. When I'm thinking about it, the word family, the Adams Family, that really is the most important word in that title. I think it becomes an organizing principle for the whole Adam's family universe. This is about a family who loves each other. And I feel like it's also 
part of a horror adjacent subgenre in itself, which is the monster family, right? Um, the Addams Family black and white TV show ran right alongside the monsters in the 1960s, which is also in this genre. It's an idea of these monstrous figures, which normally would be scary, but they're really not because we're seeing them in domestic, very affectionate situations. Uh, Ray Bradbury also has a series of stories about a family of monsters that have a reunion. The Hotel Transylvania movies, the CGI films, those feel in the in the vein of this also. It's not the Texas Chainsaw Massacre where they're showing a completely demented family and drawing horror from that. It's almost the inverse of that formula they're taking beings who, who seem horrific from the outside, but the more you learn about them, they're actually not. They're maybe horrific with each other a little bit. As I said, the kids in the Adams family, Wednesday and Bugsley Adams, they are trying to hurt each other a lot, but it's almost just an extreme version of the way brothers and sisters tend to pick on each other. And I was actually wondering while watching this, what would happen if they really did kill each other? I think they would be upset, right? If Wednesday actually succeeded in killing Bugsley, I don't think she would be happy about that. I think she would be really, really sad and heartbroken. Luckily, uh, neither of them ever succeed. So that's a little bit of background on the Adams family. It, like I said, it's not scary necessarily. It's using what would normally be scary as a form of humor. And I think this movie is hilarious. I'm not the first person to say that. Uh, it's funny because I feel like we talk a lot, very technically, on this ASMR channel about the strategies that make things scary. Why are certain things scary? Um, how are they filmed in a way that makes it scary? What are the different techniques these directors are using? And I think it's a little bit harder to break that down, at least for me, with comedy. Comedy for me just comes from such a pure and raw place that doesn't always have to do with craft. And I know that sounds silly because there certainly is a craft to joke writing, but I guess what I'm saying is what makes you laugh to me is so subjective. You either find something fun or you don't. Whereas with a horror movie, it's like, okay, you can adjust this angle and you can put this character in the periphery instead of making it a jump scare and that's going to scare me more. But with comedy, you're just going to find certain things funny and you're going to find certain things not funny. So it'll be interesting as I ramble for the next 20 minutes or so to see how much I really get into the technicalities of this movie. I'm not sure if I will because for me it's it's funny because it's funny, right? Um, a lot of that has to do with the actors. Uh, Raul Julia, who plays Gomez Adams, who was unfortunately in declining health at the time of this film, his whole M.O. is just being so enamored with his wife. I mean, if you think about it, they enjoy creepy things together, but as far as his personality, I actually don't think there's anything creepy about Gomez. It's, he's actually quite endearing in how much he loves his wife and loves his family. And Raul Julia really leans into that <laughs> with, you know, the kissing of the arm and just the looking at Angelica Houston, his wife, Morticia Adams, with doe eyes. There's something really endearing about seeing this patriarch be not domineering in the slightest. And then on the other end, Morticia, I think Angelica Houston just has such class about her and such stoicism. And I was reading that the makeup to, or the way they pinned her eyes back is Morticia actually hurt her head really bad. So she was actually very limited in how she moved, which I think actually ended up lending itself to how graceful Morticia is. And they're not really the center of this movie in the way that they are in the first film. And I'm not sure if that was intentional because Raul Julia couldn't film as much. I'm not sure if that was the case or not. But this is really about two other concurrent storylines. One with Uncle Fester, played by Christopher Lloyd. He who almost reminds me like a good guy, more heroic version of the Penguin from Batman Returns. I feel like him and Danny DeVito, who are both on Taxi together in the 70s, they're both 
with really leaning into being grotesque and left of center, but a fester is actually pretty endearing because he just wants to be loved. You could argue that Penguin just wants to be loved too, but I think that Penguin's want to be loved has evolved or devolved into him being greedy and perverted and murderous and sociopathic, whereas with Fester, it really does stay rooted in loneliness. So there are two very similar characters to me, with Christopher Lloyd being the more uh, endearing of the two. So th the movie really focuses on him and his want for romance, and Joan Cusack shows up as a supposed nanny for the children, Wednesday and Buxley, and Fester falls in love with her, and then you of course find out that she's a serial killer, and has killed several of her husbands, and it's just after his fortune, and once again we get back to that theme, right, of humans being the real monster, <laughs> um, we talked about that in Nightbreed, and that's very true in the Adams Family values as well, uh, Fester just wants to love her, and she's just plotting ways to kill him throughout the whole movie, and that ties to the the second um, big storyline of the film because the Adams family, they have a new kid in the mix, uh, Pubert <laughs> Adams, uh, and Wednesday and Buxley are jealous and they are constantly trying to kill him. As a result, they get this nanny and she thinks the best thing is for Wednesday and Buxley to go off to summer camp. And that's where most of the rest of the movie takes place, which is a really bold choice because we're really getting away from the Adams family's spooky mansion and we're going into a middle of the day brightly lit summer camp which is not where we would be used to seeing the Adams family or any monsters or supernatural creatures for that matter so the movie takes a left turn pretty early on and then you have Peter McNichol and Christine Bransky just playing these really funny aggressively cheery camp counselors and you're seeing the kids have to try to assimilate with these really rich, uh, snotty kids. And of course, that comes to Ed by the end of the film. And in way of plot, beyond that, I don't think there's much in that in this movie. And I don't mean that as an insult. It's you have great actors, and it's the Adams Family just doing their thing, and Joan Cusack just doing her thing, and Peter McNichol and Christine Bransky just doing their thing, playing these, like I said, aggressively cheerful is the best way I can describe it. I feel like that's how most of the humans are portrayed in this movie, between Joan Cusack, them, and the rest of the campers for the most part. It's, although the Adams Family are certainly weird, the humans are just as exaggerated in their own way, and they're much less likable. They're more fake. They're more concerned with status. There doesn't seem to be a lot of genuine love there. They're manipulators, and I feel like that contrast is really on display throughout the whole film. And if I had to pick an MVP, it's got to be Christina Ricci as, as uh, Wednesday Adams. As I said before, I have not watched the old show, um, or even read many of the old cartoons, so maybe she's drawing from previous performances of other portrayals of Wednesday Adams, but she does such a good job of being completely deadpan and acting a lot with her eyes, just directing rage towards these other campers, mostly with her eyes. And they kind of betray her very deadpan, sometimes sarcastic voice. And it's just so funny to watch. I haven't watched the first film in a while, but I do feel like this one is much more Wednesday Adams centric. And once again, that might be because they couldn't center quite so much on Gomez and Morticia because of Raul Julia's alpha. I don't know that for sure. That was something I was thinking, though. And then in contrast with Wednesday is Jimmy Workman as Pugsley Adams. And it's interesting because he, he does have the same um, beef with the other campers, but I do feel performance-wise, Jimmy Workman is much more straightforward and earnest as Pugsley. He's probably the least weird and creepy of the Adams family. If you saw him standing apart from them, he'd almost seem just like 
like a normal little boy. And it's, I, I haven't read too much about what Charles Adams, the original comic strip creator of the Adams Family, was trying to do with them, but it's, he's not leaning into the horror archetypes quite as much as something like the Munsters, or even Hotel Transylvania, it's not like Pugsley's a werewolf and Wednesday's a zombie, and Gomez is a vampire, and Morticia is a mummy, um, they're, like I said, they're almost just slightly skewed aristocrats uh, in their own way, and it makes for a really interesting combination. So Bugsley and Wednesday are off at camp, and this is why this is a Thanksgiving movie, and when I think about it, it doesn't make much sense, but uh, the, camp, the camp counselors, Christine Bransky and Peter McNichol, like many camps do, they have a pageant at the end of the summer, but it's a Thanksgiving play, and before rewatching this, I think this movie came out around Thanksgiving in 1993, yeah, November 19th, 1993, so it, it was marketed to be a Thanksgiving film, obviously, for the big holiday push, and it airs a lot around Thanksgiving, and as such, I think I remember I remembered it as taking place around Thanksgiving. But then when I started watching it, I said to myself, wait, why would they be going to summer camp in the middle of November? And they're not. The movie takes place in the summer. They go to this camp, and for whatever reason, the pageant at the end of summer has to do with Thanksgiving. It's a retelling of the first Thanksgiving. And I really admire the gutsiness of that. And it comes down to two things. On one hand, I thought, well, maybe they just shoehorned in that so they could more concretely tie it to Thanksgiving, to actual Thanksgiving. Maybe that was an afterthought. Or maybe they just said, hell, why not? <laughs> the movie's weird enough already. Why not just uh, have them do a Thanksgiving badge at the end of the summer rather than a variety show or a big summer musical. So, Wednesday and Bugsley are forced into this Thanksgiving pageant alongside all of these uh, rich, snobby kids and then a group of outcast kids. And, and I, I was actually surprised at the political commentary that came with this. Um, part of the joke is that this portrayal of Thanksgiving, like many portrayals of Thanksgiving throughout cinematic history, it's very sanitized. It doesn't tell the full story. It doesn't show the colonization that came with holiday like Thanksgiving. Um, it, it puts Pocahontas in there, who obviously was from a different time period. Um, it's, it's not at all accurate. And so Wednesday uses, and Bugsley, they use that as a chance to get their revenge on these other kids. They kind of band together all these outcasts who are forced to play the Native Americans while the rich, snobby white kids get to play the pilgrims, and they just go full Lord of the Flies and just destroy the camp during it. And it's funny because as they're doing that, Wednesday has this speech about how the way we choose to sanitize Thanksgiving is wrong, how no, the pilgrims came in and they took the land of the Native Americans and that there was colonization and genocide and all these things attached to it eventually. And that just rang true for me in 2020, a time when we are really having a reckoning about how we view history and gentrification and colonization. Really, I think, I don't want to say for the first time, but maybe in a widespread way, the first time in a while, really starting to acknowledge human history and white Europeans' role in sullying so much of it and doing a lot of bad things. And I have, obviously, I say that as someone who has white European descent. And so, watching this funny, macabre comedy in 2020, and then hearing Wednesday Adams go on a tear a little bit about... <laughs> how wrong this pageant is, and then get revenge. It was really uh, cathartic and satisfying. And I just think it's a sign showing that the movie has aged really well. And then when you stop and think about it, 
you're like, this is an Adams Family movie, and it's actually getting some really intelligent socio-political commentary in there, and on top of that, we still get all the macabre humor and the black comedy that comes with Joan Cusack trying to kill Fester the entire time, and we get this big finale where the family has to stop her, and it involves electrocution and her eventual death where she gets evaporated into dust. And I can't really think of another movie like this. Even other Adams Family movies don't feel like this. It's just such a convergence of strange influences. It's a little bit a horror, but not really. It's definitely a comedy, but it's a comedy in several different types of ways. It draws from dark humor. It draws from situational humor. It has physical gags. It has the straight person, it has the, the more buffoonish person. I mean, it, it's really just taking from all these different sources. It came from a New Yorker cartoon, right? So, and I, I don't know what the rhyme or reason was for threading all these elements together. I don't know if Barry Sonnenfeld and the rest of the production team sat down and said, all right, this equation goes here, this one goes here here's how these styles are going to mix themselves up, or if they just said, you know what, we're going to throw everything at the wall for this and see what comes out, almost like a Gremlins 2 approach. The movie just feels very brave to me and very different, and I think because it is about a family, and it is about them fighting for each other, and it's about them being worried about Fester and coming together at the end to defeat this villain and at the camp coming together to defeat these fake people and the camp counselors and the rest of it, it does have a warmth to it. It does have a sense of community to it. And that's what makes it a true Thanksgiving movie. And then of course the obvious Thanksgiving element and Pugsley dressed up like a turkey and saying, eat me, uh, singing the song, eat me. As a kid, I think I just really liked the funny elements of this movie, but now that I'm watching it as I'm older, like I said, it has sociopolitical commentary, it has family bonding, it has comedy, it has a couple creepy effects, it has great makeup, it just has all these things in it that really make it a holiday staple for me. And so yeah, it's the ultimate Thanksgiving movie, I think, until we get an actual horror movie that has to do with Thanksgiving. I think I mentioned this last time, but in uh, the Eli Roth, Quentin Tarantino, Robert Rodriguez, um, Rob Zombie Grindhouse film, I mean, only two of them actually directed Grindhouse, but the other directors had these fake trailers in it, and one of them was for Thanksgiving, which was... Uh, or sorry, I said Thanksgiving, that's the turkey movie. It was just called Thanksgiving in Grindhouse, and it was kind of a parody of Halloween, right? A, a holiday-themed slasher movie that had to do with Thanksgiving instead of Halloween. And from what I remember, they said they were going to actually make that um, for a while, but I don't think ever, anything ever came of it. And we need more Thanksgiving horror movies, right? I can't just do the Adams Family values every single year. Um, a, it's not a horror movie, like I said, and B, it's it's good at variety. So I would love to see some some legit good Thanksgiving horror movies, maybe over the next few years. We've got Halloween covered. We've got Christmas covered. I think there are quite a few really good Christmas horror movies, but. Thanksgiving, not so much. I can even think of a couple of good Easter-themed horror movies, but Thanksgiving is, seems to be the anomaly, which is why I chose The Addams Family Values. I hope this episode was a little bit interesting for you. I know it's a, little, a bit of a departure from the previous episodes. I, Like I said, comedy is harder to talk about for me, so I, I couldn't quite get into all the nitty-gritty of everything, at least off the top of my head. Maybe it was a nice way to break up the pace, something a little, little lighter to go into the, the big turkey eating, if that's what you celebrate. And if you celebrate something else, that's great too. So yeah, I hope you really enjoyed this. 
And like I said, next week we'll be back with our final viewer request. Um, it's going to be a fun one, so get ready. And after that, for the month of December, I'm going to be doing all Christmas horror. So you can probably guess a few titles that might be rearing their heads and getting covered. And then maybe there will be a couple surprises in there, too. I think that's all I have. I, I would say submit some more viewer requests, but like I said, I've gotten a few, and I think I know what I'm doing for this next one, and I hope you'll show up for it. As always, if you've gotten this far into the video, I, I really appreciate you indulging me for doing something a little bit different today, something not quite so scary, perhaps. Nonetheless, I hope you get some sleep. I hope you're doing well. If you are seeing family this week, I hope you're doing it in a safe manner. I hope you have a great holiday. If you're not seeing family this week, like a lot of people are, I totally understand that too. And I just hope you're all staying very safe, very happy, and very healthy. And I think we'll be out of this thing we're in, in, in a couple months, a few months. I, I have faith. Um, and maybe we can get back to some semblance of normalcy a little bit. But I still hope you're finding some joy in, in the holiday season. I know I am. And that's really important to find joy among my uh, moments of great uncertainty. Anyway, I'm rambling now. So I'm just going to stop and say be well. Thank you for being with me. Get some sleep. Don't have nightmares. Except for the good kind. And I'll see you next time. Okay. Bye-bye.